Namaskaram. Um, in, um, the, today, in, in this video, I'm going to be talking about the sixth verse of um, Arunacha, another one in my life. As I mentioned in the previous two verses, in the previous two videos in this, uh, in this series, verses uh, four, five, six, and seven are all prayers. Um, and this, this particular prayer um, links two ideas that were expressed in the previous two verses. In um, verse 5, Bhagavan sang, Man na malo udu en na ahamena man na maindira on na day. That um, means it is not appropriate, implying it's not appropriate for you to allow me. It's not appropriate to uh, perish as earth. Earth means physical matter. Thinking that the filthy body, which is earth, is I. Uh, so there Bhagavan is referring to this, to the root problem. What he, Bhagavan diagnosed as the very root cause of all problem is our identification of ourself with a body. Whenever we, the very nature of ego is to rise, to project a body and to take that body to be I. And this is the root cause of all problems. Um, so that, that is, that in verse uh, 5 he said that. In verse 6, um, he, um, in the first sentence in verse 6, he prayed to Arunachala, Lord who are Chitsarupam, one whose very nature is pure awareness, shining gloriously as the sublime uh, Sonagiri, um, bearing with or forgiving all the great wrongs of myself, this petty person, um, and protecting me in such a way that this one does not again fall in the dissolution, implying the dissolution of samsara, may, be, may you give me your look of grace, which is always showering abundantly like a rain-filled cloud. So here he, Bhagavan is praying to Arunachala to forgive all his great wrongs. So if we tie these two together, our taking us, the root of all faults is our taking ourselves as a body. Only when we rise as ego and are aware of ourselves as I am this body, do we, do we allow our attention to go out, to, do other things appear and do we allow our attention to go out to those other things and do we have desires and attachments and so on. When we take ourselves to be a body, one of the fundamental defects of identifying ourselves as a body, as a body, this body, the body we take ourselves to be is an animal body and animals reproduce by sex. So it is hardwired into this body that, uh, that urge to procreate. Actually, it's not in the body. The body is just, is just earth. But the combination of body and mind, that is the person we seem to be, we are aware of ourselves as I am male or I am female. And for most of us, that means that we have uh, we are sexually, we are attracted to members of the opposite sex. Some people it's different, as Bhagavan said in the, in the, um, in the as Bhagavan implied in the last line of the fifth verse, where he sang, Pen an aliyuru nan na aliyuru. He refers to Arunachala as the Lord, who is the form of light that transcends all the differences of male, female, and Ali. Ali means those who are neither holy male nor holy female. So people who are Ali includes homosexual, people who are attracted to uh, those of the same uh, gender. Um, but um, th that is for most of us, some, for in the case, some people are said to be asexual. They don't have any particularly strong sexual attraction. But most of us are sexually attracted either to male, uh, either to the same sex or to opposite sex, or in some cases people are bisexual, they're attracted to both, whatever it may be, this sexual attraction is, is there for most of us because we identify ourselves as a body. And this, among all the desires we have, this is one of the very, very strong desires. Um, 
because it, it is because we have taken an animal body to be ourself and because they of course all this according to Bhagavan all this is just a dream but even this but this so long as we're dreaming this dream it seems to be real and it seems to be the case that um, this uh, this animal species to which we belong the human species or any other animal species if we, we may be born as a as a dog or a horse or a cow or a camel or whatever animal we take ourselves to be most animals experience this sexual attraction and it is very strong because it is uh, it is um, it seems to be uh, required for the propagation of the species so it, it is for most of us sexual attraction is very very strong and it is it is one of the hardest desires that, to overcome. So for some people it may be relatively easy, for some people they may not be much disturbed, or not only for some people, at some stages in our life we may, we may go through times when that, um, that, uh, that, that is somehow at the back of our mind, it, it doesn't come to the forefront of our mind, that if the vasanas are still there, but somehow by grace they're kept in check and so our minds are not much disturbed by, uh, by thoughts of, um, of sex. But there may be other times in our life when these vasanas rise very strongly, but it's there in potential form in all of us, but this, this strong sexual attraction. So for most spiritual aspirants, this is, this is one of the hardest desires to overcome. However much we try to turn our mind within, when, when thoughts of, uh, about, um, about sex arise, they tend to be very, very strong thoughts. They carry a lot of, of, of emotional energy. That, is, we, we, that it, it is such a strong inclination in most of us. That is, it's a vast, in its seed form, it's called a vasana. That it's, a, it's one of the particularly strong vasanas. Um, and it's, it's there in all of us, that is, so long as we take ourselves to be a body, we cannot, it may seem to us that we are asexual or we are not, we are not much troubled by such thoughts now, but at any time these thoughts can rise in our mind. And sometimes when, when we, it, sometimes it, it may happen in our life, but for many years we're not troubled by these thoughts and suddenly these thoughts rise up with tremendous for, force. In my case, most of the time I was living in Tiruvannamalai, somehow, of course, as a teenager, I, as most teenagers, we think a lot about these, these thoughts are very strong in the mind. But somehow when I came to Tiruvannamalai, the idea of marriage, of sex, of all these things, somehow it just went out of my mind for many, many years. Um, all the time I was with uh, Sadhuam, I, I didn't think of these things at all. It, my mind wasn't troubled by these thoughts at all. But at one point, suddenly these things, uh, this, this rose very strongly in my mind. So we, we can never, we should never think that we have overcome uh, this uh, sexual attraction. And there's a story in the Puranas to illustrate this about Narada. Narada was a, a great uh, rishi, a great sage, a great devotee. At one time, he developed a pride, I, but he had uh, that was in his heart. It wasn't that he didn't express it outwardly, but in his heart, he felt, "I have conquered lust. I have overcome lust. I'm not. I'm no longer subject to lust." He was thinking, and there was a slight pride in his heart about that. This was known to um, to uh, Mahavishnu. So to teach him a lesson, by by the power of Maya. He, um, I, I can't remember the details of the story. It may be the same story may be told slightly differently. But anyway, he, he met a girl and he fell in love and he, um, he got married and everything. And um, he, 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 the, the whole point, I can't, as I say, I can't remember the details of the story, but the point of the story was, was to teach the lesson that so long, until ego is annihilated, none of us can none of us should feel that we are we have overcome sex that is those vasanas are there in our heart even if they're not manifesting at this moment in time even if they're not manifesting in this period in our life 
at any time this uh, this strong sexual desire can raise its ugly head in our mind. So that is what this verse is about. Because Bhagavan, Bhagavan, because Bhagavan is the true self of each one of us. He knows, he he understands the that is he's diagnosed the very root cause of all problems are rising as ego and consequently taking ourselves to be a body. That is the root cause, and he understands the nature of the vasanas that arise as a result of our rising as ego. That is, to whom are all vasanas? They're only for ego. As ego, because it's our nature, as he says in verse 25 of Ulunapdu, Urupatri undam, Urupatri nikkum, Urupatri undu mekongong. Grasping form, it comes into existence. Grasping form, it stands. Grasping and feeding on forms, it flourishes abundantly. So this is the nature of ego, grasping form, grasping things other than itself. That is the very nature of ego. So it's the very nature of ego to have Vishaya Vasana, strong inclination to attend to things other than, than uh, oneself. And the, among those inclinations, one particularly strong one is this, um, is this Vasana, this inclination to, uh, to desire sexual pleasure. Um, that inclination, sometimes it may not be manifest, but at other times it may manifest very strongly. But it's there, it's there in all of us. So long as we take ourselves to be a body, this is there in potential form. So this is, so knowing that this is a, a problem that many spiritual aspirants face, um, Bhagavan composed this verse. Under what circumstances he composed this verse, we don't know. But I suspect it was probably one of his devotees was maybe finding themselves much troubled by such thoughts at some time, and Bhagavan may have composed this verse for the benefit of that devotee. That's, that's pure guesswork, I don't know, I don't think anyone knows the circumstances under which Bhagavan composed this verse, but we can guess that that may have been the case. But anyway, it, it, it is for the benefit of all of us that Bhagavan composed this verse, and it's a very, it's a very simple and very beautiful verse. Um, uh, um, what he says in this verse is, um, in the first sentence he says, um, uh, Kamari Indrani Ambaral Indrame uh, uh, Kadatidu Tidu Padu Kindrai. That means you are always described by devotees as the slayer of lust. Um, the slayer of lust, uh, Kamari. Kamari means the, one, the, the killer of lust. Uh, that, Shiva is, is, is described as Kamari, the one who, who, killed, uh, who kills lust. Because again, there's a Puranic story about this, <laughs> like there are Puranic stories about so many things, but these are all the illustrative things. That is, once Lord Shiva was doing tapas, and um, I don't know, there were, maybe the gods wanted him to get married in order to, for some reason, anyway, they, 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 they sent Karma, they sent the god of lust, to him, to shoot an arrow at him, to and um, to make him fall in love, and when Karma shot that arrow at him, he opened his third eye. His third, of course, in the in um, in iconography, it is depicted literally as a third eye in the centre of the forehead. But that is a that is a metaphor. The third eye is a metaphor for the eye of a knowledge, the jnana kan. The, the, uh, the eye of pure, of pure awareness. So the eye of knowledge, he opened that eye and he burnt karma. That, what that signifies is that if, if we attain jnana, if we know ourselves as we actually are, karma will thereby be destroyed. But until we know ourselves as we actually are, until our eye of knowledge is open by being aware of ourselves as we actually are, we are always liable to be, um, to be, uh, to, uh, to, to they, 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 these, that vasana, the inclination to desire sexual uh, thing is there in our heart. Whether it's manifest or not, it is there and it can raise its ugly head at any time. So um, here Bhagavan is referring to that, uh, that uh, story that uh, she, Lord Shiva uh, burnt karma, destroyed karma. Um, but of course, uh, though Lord Shiva, for him, he's unaffected by karma, by karma, that, that desire, sexual desire, lust, 
we are still affected. So the story goes on that um, that um, if, if having burnt karma, then there, there can be no further procreation because nobody will have any sexual desire. So the gods then prayed to Lord Shiva, and he then granted karma the boon to continue, but without a physical body. So karma is known as the bodiless one, um, which Bhagavan refers to later in this verse. So that makes him even more dangerous. When he comes as in the form of like a, a Cupid-like form and uh, shoots in the arrow of love, if you can see him, it's, it's easier to detect him, but he's, he is bodiless. That is, a, that is to, all this is to illustrate, uh, that is to depict the fact that lust is like a, like a ghost, which is always there in our heart, but can rear its ugly head at any time. It's bodiless like a ghost. It's got no form, but suddenly it can sprout up. So anyway, in, as I say, in this, in this first sentence, what Bhagavan says is, Kamari Endrumi, um, uh, Ambaral Endrume, uh, uh, Kadatidu Padukindrai. Uh, that is, you are always uh, described, uh, Endrume means always, Ambaral, devotees, uh, as the slayer of lust. Um, uh, so, the, the, the uh, yes, Kamari means the slayer of lust. And then in the next sentence he says, Arm, arm, may. Arm means uh, it is. It, it, it's used in Tamil, often arm is used in the sense of, same sense as we use the word yes in English. Uh, so, uh, arm, arm means yes, yes, or it is so, it is so. May means it is true. Um, but then he goes on to say, Unuku idu ama endru ai oram. Ai means a doubt. Ai uh, oram means a doubt rises. Unuku uh, uh, idu ama. Whether this is suitable for you, whether he, are you really fit to be called karma, Kamari? That is, uh, though all your devotees call you Kamari, are you, the doubt arises, are you fit to be called Kamari? And then comes the address, Arunachaleshwarane. He addresses, to whom is this verse addressed? It's addressed to Arunachaleshwara. Arunachaleshwara means Ishwara, God, in the form of Arunachala. So Ar Arunachaleshwara. Arunachaleshwarane. Um, so he's addressing Arunachala, he's addressing God in the form of Arunachala, and he's saying that doubt arises in me whether this is suitable for you. Are you really fit to be called Kamari? Why does he have this doubt? He explains in the next sentence. Am I in? If it is, if it is suitable, if it is so that you are Kamari, um, um, Engan at Dirane Surane Ayanum Vallanangan Kamari Ahum Unkal Aran Sarana Puhu Karutinul Puha Valane. Um, Engan means how. Uh, Puha Valane means how can he enter? Who who is the he referred to here? Angan. Uh, angan. Sorry, Anangan. Anangan. Uh, anga means uh, a limb or a body. Ananga means one who is bodiless. So Anangan is, is a name of, um, of, uh, calm, uh, of karma, of lust. So he's the bodiless one. He's, uh, as I said, according to that Quranic story, the, the body of karma was burnt by Lord Shiva, but he was allowed to continue to exist in, the, in a bodiless form. Uh, because for the, for the propagation of, uh, I mean, for the continuation of species, uh, the, the karma is, uh, has a role to play. It, it's an inevitable part. If we take ourselves to be a body, we seem to be born and we seem to die. And, uh, um, and how are we born? We are born as a result of um, the, the union of our mother and father, the sexual union of our mother and father. And this is how creation goes on. So karma has a role to play, but for the spiritual aspirant, it is a, because anything that draws our attention away from ourselves towards anything else is, is, um, is, is taking us away from 
what we actually are. What we actually are is a pure awareness and we can experience pure awareness only by turning our attention within. So anything that draws our attention outwards is harmful. And anything that has, has a great power to draw our attention outwards is particularly harmful. So that is why for spiritual aspirants, this, uh, this lust is a great problem. This sexual desire is a great problem. Um, and why Bhagavan composed this verse? So, so how can Angan, uh, uh, sorry, how can an Angan, uh, how does he have the power or ability to enter? And then he says, uh, the, oh, how can that, uh, that, um, how can that uh, Val Anangan, Val means powerful, how can that powerful Anangan, Dirane Surane Ayanam, Dirane means uh, brave, um, uh, Surane means valiant, so Dirane Surane Ayanam, though brave and valiant, uh, uh, how can he enter, uh, enter what? Karutinal, uh, the mind, um, a mind that Un kal aran sarana puhu karutinol. In a enter a mind that takes refuge in the fortress of the of your feet. Uh, so your feet, and he, then he refers to you as uh, as that Arunacha. He's addressing Arunacha as kamari ahum. So the the meaning of the whole sentence is, if it is suitable, how can that mighty bodiless one, an angan, uh, though brave and valiant, enter a mind that takes refuge in the fortress of the feet of you who are the slayer of karma. Um, so th this, is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is a prayer when, he, when Bhagavan asks that, is it suitable? I, I have a doubt whether it's suitable for you. Is it suitable? How can he, this karma enter the mind? So this is a very suitable prayer for us. Whenever we find our, that is, as Bhagavan often used to say, the, it, what is harmful is not, that if, for example, if you're, if you're married and you, you, it is natural to, to have sex and to have children and everything, that is, the actual act of sex is not what is harmful, it is the thought of it, the desire for it, it karma, karma, though karma is, um, but the original meaning of karma is just desire. Um, uh, but it, 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 it comes to mean specifically sexual desire, lust, because of all the desires we have, this is one of the strongest. So um, the, the harm lies not in the act of sex, but in the desire for sex. And of course, why do we engage in the act of sex? It's because of the desire. But the, the problem is not the act of sex, because that sex, so long as this world seems to be true, sex seems to be necessary for the propagation of the species. But it is the desire for that. But why is that desire harmful? Be because it's a very strong desire. And being a very strong desire, it's got a strong power, power to pull our mind outwards. Of course, we are always free. We have that free, as Bhagavan said, we have Tantra, we have freedom of will. Freedom of will means, though we have vasanas, which sprout in the form of likes, dislikes, desires, and so on, though we have these vasanas, we are free either to allow ourselves to be swayed by them or not to allow ourselves to be swayed by them. But when a, when a vasana is very strong, that means, the vasana is, it, who, a vasana means an inclination. That means when we have a strong inclination, we often, we, we allow ourselves to be swayed by that inclination. Because, why do we allow ourselves to be swayed by it? Because we want to be, uh, that, it, it, this, is all, this is all the workings of the will. So we allow ourselves, when we allow ourselves to be swayed by our vasanas, we allow ourselves to be swayed by them because we want to allow ourselves to be swayed by them. So that we have a very strong urge to allow ourselves to be swayed by this vasana of sexual attraction. So uh, this, is the, this is the problem we're up against. So I mean, any vasana, in all vishaya vasanas, anything that draws our mind away from ourselves towards vishayas, anything other than ourselves, is harmful. But why is this... Uh, why, why is sometimes this sexual desire singled out 
as a particularly harmful vasana because of the strength of it. If you've got a if you've got a vasana which isn't particularly strong, it's it's relatively easy not to allow yourself to be swayed by it. But we, but when a vasana is particularly strong, we very easily allow ourselves to be swayed by it. So what is the solution? The solution is, as Bhagavan implies in this verse, the solution is to take refuge in the fortress of the feet of Arunachalishwara. What is the fortress of his feet? What are, he, what are the feet of Arunachalishwara? It is that which is shining in our heart as eye. So when we are troubled by thoughts of sex, the, the most effective way to avoid being swayed by those thoughts, by those desires, is to cling firmly to self-attentiveness. But often we will fail in that attempt because though we have some liking to cling to self-attentiveness, we have more liking to indulge in those thoughts and those desires. So um, we, we, we can... If, 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 um, if we are troubled by thoughts of sex, that means though we have taken refuge in his feet, at that moment we allow ourselves to slip away from his feet and to, to be swayed by that vasana. So, um, the, in, in this verse, Bhagavan seems to be rebuking Arunachala, but he's actually he's reminding us that why we, have, why we allow ourselves to be swayed by this desire or any desire of any sort is because we, are, we, instead of taking refuge in his feet by clinging firmly to I am, we are allowing our mind to go outwards. So, um, so it, it, we are always free at every moment in our life. We, are, we always have a, we, we always have that Ichwa Swatantra is our very nature. As Bhagavan explained, what we actually are is Brahman. So, as Brahman, we alone exist. So we have infinite freedom. That is, uh, Paripurna Brahma Swatantra. The very nature of Brahman is to have infinite freedom. Why? Because there is nothing other than Brahman to limit its freedom. So, as we actually are, as in our real nature, we are infinitely free. When we rise as ego, our freedom is seemingly limited. Why? Because we've limited ourselves in, within the confines of this body consisting of five sheaths. So, so uh, just like our existence, uh, sat, is limited, our awareness is limited, our happiness is limited, because we've identified, because we've limited ourselves with this body, likewise our freedom is limited. So, but we, even though our freedom is limited, we are still free. So we always we always have freedom, and the most fundamental freedom we have is the freedom the what Bhagavan called Ichwa Satantra, the freedom of will. We are free at each moment in our life. We have a fundamental freedom. Do we allow our attention to be swayed by vasanas and to go out towards vishayas, or do we turn our attention back towards ourselves? And we can turn out whatever vishay, whatever vishayas may appear. Bhagavan has given us a very simple means to turn our attention back to ourselves. To whom does it appear? Whatever may appear, it appears only to us. So whatever may appear, we are always free to turn our attention back to ourselves. But most of the time, because of the strength of our Vishaya Vasanas, we are instead of turning our attention back towards ourselves, we are allowing ourselves to be swayed by our Vishaya Vasanas and to go after the Vishayas. And one of the, the among all those um, vishayas that we are attracted to, that we are, our mind is drawn towards, is this vishaya of sexual experience. So, um, and this is a particularly strong one. So, whenever the thoughts of lust arise in our mind, we have a choice. Either we allow ourselves to be swayed by those thoughts, or we cling firmly to self-attentiveness. Because of the strength of that inclination, we often allow ourselves to be swayed by it, at least to a certain extent. That is, the, the inclination to, to, to allow thoughts of sex to arise in our mind, to, to notice um, beautiful forms or whatever. It, it, you know, to the, in so many ways our mind is drawn outwards by, by the, the beauty of the, of the attractiveness of the opposite sex or 
anyone we are sexually attracted to, whether opposite sex or same sex, whatever the case may be, that is that tendency is there. So whether it's just thinking about it in our mind or allowing our mind to go outwards to see things that we consider sexually attractive, these this is all allowing our attention away from ourselves towards something else. So because of the strength of our of the, of this particular vasana, we often allow ourselves to uh, to be swayed by this vasana. Um, but we are always free, however strongly this vasana may arise within us, to whom does it arise? It arises only to me. So we can always turn our attention back within and thereby take refuge in the fortress of his feet. If we allow our attention to go outwards, we can't blame Arunachaleshwara. He's making the fortress of his feet ever available to us by shining in our heart as eye. If we allow our attention to go outwards and to, to, to dwell on thoughts of sex or, or images or whatever it may be, that is because that is our, we are misusing our freedom. Instead of using our freedom to cling to I am, to take refuge in his feet by clinging to I am, we are misusing our freedom to allow it to go outwards to dwell on such thoughts. So the choice is always ours, but often when, when um, because of the strength of our desires, we, we often succumb to them. And we know that we can overcome this, uh, this, uh, this desire only by clinging to I am, but because the desire is so strong, we've got more de uh, liking to uh, um, to be swayed by that desire than to cling to, uh, to I am. So at that stage, prayer is very helpful. So that is why Bhagavan has given us this prayer. Whenever we, whenever our mind is much troubled by such thoughts, and when we, we find the thoughts are so strong that we don't even have a liking to, to turn our attention back to ourselves, the one to whom the thoughts are, appear, then this is a very, very suitable prayer. Uh, as what Bhagavan says in this verse, if I just read the whole meaning, Arunakteshwara, uh, you who are always described by devotees as Karmari, sorry, you are always described by devotees as Karmari. Yes, yes, true. Yes, it is certainly true. He is Karmari. But a doubt arises in me uh, whether this is suitable for you. Why? Because if it is suitable, how can that mighty bodiless one, that, uh, that lust, that karma, though brave and valiant, enter a mind that takes refuge in the fortress of your feet, who are the slayer of karma? So this, this last line should remind us, oh, why has this... If, I've, if I had truly taken refuge in his feet, this thought wouldn't be disturbing me. Why this thought of... Why, the thought, why, the, why this lust, uh, this desire is disturbing me? Because I'm not, because instead of taking refuge in his feet, I'm allowing my, my attention outwards towards these things. So what is the solution? To take refuge again in his feet, to cling firmly to his feet by clinging to I am. His feet means that which is shining in our heart as I. So this is the, this is the way uh, Bhagavan is expressing, Firstly, he's expressing this in the form of a prayer, but he's also giving us a clue in this last line how to deal with this, um, how to, that is, prayer is one way of dealing with this, but the most effective way of dealing with it is to take refuge in his feet. What does taking refuge in his feet mean? It means clinging only to I am. If we cling to I am, if we cling so firmly to I am, but we don't give room to the rising of any other thought, we will not be disturbed by, um, by whatever vasana may arise, as Bhagavan says, we are killing it. If you cling to I am, you are, kill, you are cutting the vasana at the very point it rises. And as he says in the 11th paragraph of Nana, when he, uh, in 10th and 11th paragraph, Bhagavan talks about the share vasana. In the, towards uh, the last two sentences of the 11th paragraph, Bhagavan gives a very nice analogy. He says, um, um, Kotei kul edirigal ullavare 
உள்ள வரையில் அதிலிருந்து வெளியே வந்து வந்து கொண்டே இருப்பார்கள் தட் மீன்ஸ் ஸோ லாங் அஸ் அஸ் எனமீஸ் எக்ஸிஸ்ட் இன் ஃபோர்ட்ரெஸ் தே வில் பி கம்மிங் அவுட் ஃப்ரம் இட் um they will continue coming out from it here the fortress he's referring to is uh, is is not not uh, is not the fortress of his feet it's the fortress of our own heart that is so long as they uh, so long as we still have those vasanas in our heart they will continue coming out that is is the very nature of vasanas to come out because if you if if a fortress is being uh, besieged and um they why will the enemy come out of a fortress surely they're safe in the fortress surely they should stay inside no they come out why do they come out because they need food and water if there's no food and water in the fortress they have to come out to forage for food and water so the the food and water that nourishes and sustains ego and its army of vasanas is um is is uh is the attention that we give to the vishayas um so the vishaya vasanas are, are constantly rising in order to try and draw our attention away from ourselves towards those vishayas so uh if we so that is what bhagavan refers to as the enemies coming out from the fortress and inevitably so they will continue coming out constantly so long as they're still there because they need to they need to, for their survival they need to distract our attention away from ourselves towards vishayas so they keep on coming out and then he says um uh vara vara as as on when they come as on when they come are they gay are they gay elam vetti konde uh irandal if we continue cutting them down as on when they come kote uh kai vasapadam the fortress will be eventually be uh, will, will will be captured that is the fortress the vasanas are, are uh, uh, the fortress in which the vasanas exist is our own heart if we want to capture that we have to cut them down as and when they come so how do we cut them down bhagavan says earlier in that paragraph um manatin kan idu variyal vishaya vasana gal irukinjanavo adu varil nana ennam vicharanayam vendam so long as the vishaya vasanas exist in the uh, in the mind they um they uh, there's so long the investigation who am i is necessary then he says ninevugal tondra tondra when thought as uh, when thoughts appear and appear in other words as and when thoughts appear apode kapode then and there avegale avegale alam uh, all of them utpatistana tileye in the very place from which they arise vicharane inal by vichara nasipika vendam they it's necessary to destroy them in the very place from which they arise that means as soon as the vasana arises how do we kill it in the very place from which it rises as soon as it arises only by clinging firmly to i am but the more we cling to ourselves the, the the less we will be swayed by whatever vasanas uh, arise so this is that is what bhagavan refers to in this verse as taking refuge in the fortress of his feet so we need to cling firmly to self attentiveness in order to overcome whatever vasanas may arise and among all the vasanas that rise the one type of vasana which is particularly strong and which we are particularly liable to be swayed by is this vasana of sex which is why bhagavan this vasana of lust of sexual desire this is uh, this is why bhagavan composed this verse so this is a very nice prayer if ever we find that we are troubled by um thoughts of lust and we find that we uh the desire is so strong that we don't we're not even inclined to cling to self attentiveness then the next best resort is the is this prayer that bhagavan has given us and in this prayer he's he's embedded a reminder what is the way to by implication he's embedded a reminder what is the way to overcome uh this uh, this uh, strong sexual desire 
It's by taking refuge in his feet. And taking refuge in his feet means clinging firmly to I am. So Bhagavan has given us a very, a very, that in this verse, Bhagavan, firstly, he gives us a nice prayer. And secondly, he, he gives us a clue, but how to, that is, a, what is the efficacy of prayer? Prayer means we are aligning our will with the will of God. If we pray for, if we pray for anything that God doesn't want, that is not appropriate prayer. The, the perp, that is, people who have kamyata prayer, pray, prayers for the fulfillment of desire, um, their prayers are not in accordance with the will of God. But when we come to the spiritual path, the only permissible prayers are prayers where we are praying for what Bhagavan wants for us. What Bhagavan wants for us is the annihilation of ego. So that is what all prayers should be aimed for, for the annihilation of ego. So in order to overcome, in order to annihilate ego, we need to overcome all our Vishaya Vasanas. One particularly strong Vishaya Vasana is, is this lust. So in order to overcome this, we must have the, we must have the desire, the liking to overcome it. So when we find our liking to over, our, our liking for to enjoy that uh, thoughts of sex is stronger than our liking to cling to I am, then prayer is appropriate because that is trying to realign our our, our desire uh, to, uh, along with Bhagavan's desire. Bhagavan doesn't want us to be seeking happiness in petty external uh, pleasures. He wants us to find the infinite happiness, which is our own real nature, which can be found only in our own heart. So this prayer is, um, is, is a reminder to us we shouldn't allow ourselves to be troubled by thought, if, by thoughts of sex. If we allow ourselves to be troubled by, when these vasanas rise, if we allow ourselves to be swayed by them, that is because we are, we are failing to take refuge in the fortress of his feet. So what is the solution? To take refuge in the fortress of his feet by clinging to I am. And if we, if we find our liking to cling to I am at that moment is not strong enough, then this prayer is a very, a very great aid to us and a reminder to us that of the importance of taking refuge on his feet, clinging firmly to I am. So Bhagavan, Bhagavan has given us prayers suitable for all, all the problems that we may face in the spiritual path. This is one particular problem that we all, all face sooner. If not at this moment in our life, at some moment in life, we are, we are, all, that is, we are always liable to be troubled by such thoughts. So, um, and when we're troubled by these thoughts, our attention is going out towards things other than ourselves and uh, thereby diverting it away from self-attentiveness. In other words, it's, it's, it's allowing ourselves to be attracted away from the fortress of his feet out into the world. So to, uh, this is a reminder to us, we must return to the fortress of his feet and take refuge in him by clinging firmly to I am. Because Aranacheshwari is that which is always shining in our heart as I am. Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Aranachala Ramanaya